Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Vineyard Columbus. My name is Joshua, one of the pastors here. Welcome to everyone who's watching online. Hey, we're going to worship Jesus this morning. So feel free to clap your hands, to sing out, and let's just worship him together. Can we do that? All right, here we go. Let's sing every praise. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every Every praise is to 
way of receiving from the Lord this morning. As we sing this song, saying that he gives exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. Let's just ask to receive from the Lord today. What is it that you need from him? Holy Spirit, we invite you. Jesus, today we bless you. We know that you are good. Come and have it all, pray. Come now. 
to meet with you, to hear your words that give us life, to be in community with each other. And so Spirit, we ask that you'd be with us today. Would you bless this time we have in Jesus' name? And we all said, amen. 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 that we're doing on the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts and, and what we're seeing in this series and really throughout the whole Bible is that when, when we grow in a hunger for dependency on God, that we begin to, to desire more and more of the gifts of God in our lives. And that's what we see all through the New Testament. We see that really clearly that there's a hunger for things like a powerful witness of the Spirit. There is a hunger to receive gifts of healing, to see God show up and do miracles. And it all comes out of this place of dependency on God. God, we need you, we need you, we need you. But it wasn't just those gifts that the early church grew in dependency on. See, when when there was a dependency on God, what you saw in the early church was also this increase and overflow of generosity. That what happened when God came in their midst is that they were freed up, so much so that you see in, in Acts 4 that the disciples gave land and possessions, and then it says this, and there were no needy persons among them. Amen. Imagine that. No needy persons among them because 
of this dependency on God and an overflow of the Spirit. And, and what we see happen is that when God comes, he begins to untangle all of the idols in our hearts and all of the false dependencies and all of the things that we hang on to and we get freed up to love and worship God with an overflow. The picture you might have are like, you know, we have so many things in the world that we're coming with that are so heavy, right? And I think of like two clenched fists full of just heavy bags of all the things that we carry. And, and what we do is we just let go and we say, God, I trust you. I trust you, I trust you, I trust you. And God comes in the midst of that and he fills us with his spirit. And church, I wanna encourage us throughout this season that as we press into the things of the spirit that you would just ask God for an overflow in your heart and in our church to be the kind of church where there would be no needy persons among them because we see such a move of God. Amen. 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 It is such a work of God and it would never happen apart from the spirit coming. I wanna pray and just pray for our offering as we receive the offering. Would you pray with me, God? We pray for more and more dependency on you in our own lives. God, we just say that these bags that we bring in, these heavy loads, God, that you are more than sufficient. You are more than enough. You are more than able, God. And I pray for us, Lord, each one of us as individuals and as a whole church, God, that you might free us up more and more to be dependent on you and your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would come, that you would flood this church with the gifts of your spirit Amen. and also gifts of generosity, that we might be freed in every area of our lives to trust you. Amen. We welcome you, God. Would you be with us in Christ's name? Amen. Amen. Church, I want to encourage you to give generously today. The ushers are going to come and pass the bags and uh, you can give there. Also, if you've not started a regular habit of giving, you can also give very easily by texting the word give to 98977. All right, thank you. Hi, Pastor Adrian. Hello, how are you? Good, good He's, to see you. You took good my to introduction. See all of you. You, you're stepping on my, my part. That's what I do. It's <laughs> a problem I have. It's just so stepping on my part. You can step on me now. <laughs> so, for those of you, well, you now you know who I am. For those of you who have, do not, we haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I am Pastor Adrian Ash. I am in our Next Steps ministry, and this is. Pastor Eric Pickerel, Pickerel. Senior, Senior Pastor. pastor. Thank yes, you. there we go. And we are really, really grateful to be able to be here and worship with you all. Before we move forward, though, I do want to go ahead and dismiss our middle schoolers. If you're here and if you're new, and you and if you're new and you have a middle schooler with you, you can have your children follow this crowd out here. We have a middle school program with Pastor Santos and Pastor Hannah in the morning, so that you can they can go out that way. But again, we are really grateful to be able to worship with you all. And if you are new, whether or not you're here in person or you're here online, just to let you know a little bit more about our church, we are a multi-site, multi-generational church that is committed to developing multi-ethnic communities of disciples that love, that experience God, love one another, and partner with Christ to heal the world. And so I say all that to you to know that there is always a space here for you. So if you're here and you want to learn more about us, there is a space for everyone here at our church and we would love to help you learn more about us and get more connected and you can do that by texting the word hi to 98977 you're going to get a little form fill that form out somebody from our church is going to get in contact with you and just answer any questions that you might have or let you know any other way that you can get plugged in here to our church and if you are here in person you can come out to the guest central location that's out in the lobby after service and there'll be pastors there that would love to meet you as well yeah we would love to meet you yeah. Um, well, am I allowed to say You're going, yeah. that Julie is my favorite preacher? I think that's okay. Is that that's okay? allowed. That's if allowed. If I didn't, there might be a problem. There might be some problems. Uh, so please welcome up my favorite preacher, <laughs> Pastor Julia. Morning, everybody. How you doing? Fantastic. 
Um, I love those two. Those two, Pastor Adrian and Pastor Eric, some of my faves. Glad that you're here today. Glad if you're uh, here with us online, I'm glad that you are here today. In just a minute, I'm gonna jump right into the series that we began last week called The Gifts. Uh, We're gonna take a look today at just a little bit of a text that St. Paul wrote to the young church in Corinth. And before I do that though, I wanna pull back a little bit and reflect on the why. Reflect on the why, why are we doing this? And for me, I don't know about you, but I'm one of those people who tend to be impacted by the weight of the world around me. And these days I feel increasing kinds of weight. So I want to begin by talking about two very true and almost opposite realities. The first reality is this, is that collectively speaking, People over the whole world wide right now are doing better than they have ever done. There is a reality to progress in the world. Children are healthier. Wars are fewer. You can look at all the data from literacy to poverty to health care to maternal health, and you can see that there is this progress in the world. People collectively are doing better. And there is still another reality, isn't there? It's that in the face of collective progress, no matter how far we seem to be able to go, in this world, there will be trouble. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a theological frame for that. And the theological frame for that is sin. There is something broken in this world Sid, not just like, ooh, the bad stuff that I do that I hope nobody ever talks about or learns, but sin the thing that makes me unable to not do it. Sin the thing that has corrupted the whole world. And the impact of sin is that in this world, there will be trouble. And as we look at the world around us, we we see what is happening in Gaza and in Israel, and we watch this... uh, uh, horrendous terrorist attack through Hamas. We are confronted with all of this, aren't we? And there's three components, three ways of understanding the impact of sin that I wanna remind us of because we live in a world that likes to make everything simple. And my sisters and my brothers, most things in this world are not simple. The first reality is this, is that while sin impacts all of us, The trouble that it causes impacts us unevenly in this world. And so we see children and the most vulnerable among us and the elderly and the infirm more deeply impacted by trouble. And this is true whether or not we're talking about war or family trouble, right? Whether or not we're talking about a place way far away or we're talking about our own neighborhoods. In this world, You will have trouble, and some people feel the weight of the trouble more than others. There's an unevenness to the impact of sin in this world, and it's not just uneven, it's complex. The impact of sin and trouble in this world are layered and layered and layered and layered. This is why nothing is ever solved by a statement or a social media post, ever. Because if there were simple answers to these problems, we would do the simple thing. But it's not simple, my sister and my brother. It is complex. And not only is it uneven and is it complex, but sin and trouble in this world, we know through the scripture, is always filled with hostility. The mark of sin in this world is an us versus them, a dividing wall, a mine and a yours. Do you see this in your own heart, in our world? And so we look around us and we see these layers of unevenness and complexity and hostility. And we as Christians recognize, aha, This is what the scripture is talking about when it says, for all have sinned and all need a rescue. It is the truth 
that like any software writer knows, like if you're the code, you can't fix yourself. You need a fixer. So as followers of Jesus, then what do we do when we're confronted with this reality of trouble and sin? Well, I would posit that there is one primary question for you to ask. Not only one question, but one primary question. And that primary question is, how do you stand firm and hold fast to Christ and Christ-likeness in this world? Note that I did not just say, how do I hold fast to Christ? Because me and Jesus is pretty easy. Anybody? you like, me and Jesus all day long. I drink my cup of coffee with Jesus. I take a walk at Enniswood with Jesus, and I look at the colors in the trees with Jesus. Me and Jesus. But to hold fast to Christ and Christ-likeness, my friends, that's a whole different ballgame. And the thing that we know is that God came incarnate in the world to show us how he would be in this world. He put on a body, skin, and bones to show us how he would walk through, guess what, religious hostility, occupation, violence, injustice, unevenness, Hostile. We, we see in Jesus one who walked the way through. And not only did he walk the way through, he went further than anyone could ever go because he submitted himself to death. And then, because he is God, he rose up and said, I am the first, I will be the last. It is through me that you can walk this whole road out and not be stopped with this wall of death and pain and sin that everyone around us is stopped by. It is through Jesus that the gate is opened up. And he says, now my sisters and my brothers, go have a conference. No, wait, he didn't say that. He said, now my sisters and my brothers, I have a really awesome prayer time at your Bible study. Now, my sisters and my brothers, be filled with the Spirit and listen to worship music all day long and rejoice and be glad because you have been saved by Jesus. All of those things are good things. But what did he say? He said, now, my sisters and brothers, therefore, go. Therefore, go. All authority and heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go, I am with you to the ends of the ages, he says. There is a world right now that needs a going people who look like Jesus. And that, my friends, is why we eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. Scripture tells us and we see on the news, the whole earth is groaning. And what is it groaning for? What are children and mothers and grandparents and fathers and terrified soldiers? What is everyone groaning for? They are groaning for shalom, the way it's supposed to be. And that only comes through the God of the universe. It only comes through the God of the universe. And so we put our hands out and we sing, Holy Spirit, come. We are groaning. We are desperate for you. And we have faith that the good and generous Father of all that is has come into this world to show you and I a different sort of way about how to be right now. My friends, there is a lot of work to be done. And if we try to do it on our own, we will get like four days in and then we will just need like a venti latte. I heard someone say this week, I want to make a difference, not make a point. They were talking about some of the protests at different Ivy League universities that were uh, so upsetting for many to watch. I want to make a difference, they said, not a point. What Jesus did when he walked 
in the world among us is he gathered a group of people around him and he said, there's a new way, my sisters and my brothers. There's a new kingdom, my sisters and my brothers. It is marked by my shalom, my sisters and my brothers. Let's go make a difference. Let's hasten the kingdom of God into this world. So the question for you is like, okay, well, how? Tomorrow's Monday. I got a comp paper. My kids got an algebra test, and I don't even know how to do their algebra. Like, are you kidding me? Like, the how is that we come to the Lord and we eagerly desire his gifts. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you fill us? Would, would, would you let me go to my office in a different sort of way tomorrow? Would you let me go to my classroom in a different sort of way? Would you let me be a different sort of person in this world? Would you let me hold fast, not just to Christ, but to Christ-likeness so that when I show up, people take a glimpse at me and they say, there is something peculiar about this person. There is something peculiar about the way that they walk in the world and it gives me hope that there is more. So let's pray and remind ourselves why we pray, come Holy Spirit, as we do. Father, We are just all so aware, whether it's in our, like, our, like many of us, like we've gotten fights this morning with our families and it's like, God, there's just so many places we need you from the smallest to the most massive. And we wanna be a church, Lord, that demonstrates your gifts because you are such a good giver and we want to demonstrate your gifts as an overflow, Lord. And we each need you. And so today, God, would you deposit a greater awareness of your presence into us? Would you help us lean more into you, God? Would you put your power on this congregation, Lord? Would you help us to be not just the church that you've called us to be, but the individuals tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., Tuesday at 3. Help us be Christ-like in this world, and would you fill us by your Spirit? Because without that, we've got no hope. Open our eyes to you, Lord. Stir up our faith, Lord. Amen. Amen. So 1 Corinthians 12, a little bit of a refresher from last week. And over the next three weeks, we're going to dig deeper into the particular gifts of the Spirit. So for those of you who are really interested in those nuances, we're getting there. This is a little bit of a setup again. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul's word. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. Thanks, Paul. In the message version, I love this. This is complex and misunderstood, but I want you to be informed and knowledgeable. I love that Paul says this. This is gonna be a little complex and misunderstood, so I wanna help you sort of adjust your posture. Paul is offering the church in Corinth not brand new teachings about the gift. He's offering them correctives and instructions. Now, when I was little, I went to ballet class. Anybody go to ballet class when they were little? All right, ballet class people. I have this great memory of walking around ballet class and you'd have your arm out like that and the teacher would walk next to you and, and they just, and what they wanted was like, huh? Huh. A slight adjustment, right? Now some of you might do that in golf or baseball. I don't know those sports at all. But I imagine, maybe. You have a coach and the coach walks around and they give you a slight adjustment. Hold yourself a little bit this way. Hold your posture a little bit this way. That's what Paul is doing to the church in Corinth. He's saying, this is a complex conversation and I don't want you to be misinformed, so I'm going to offer you some correctives. And this goes along the lines of what Paul says when he wrote to Timothy at a different time where he says, watch your life and doctrine closely. In other words, this stuff matters and what you believe about it matters. And so Paul is offering us a corrective. Now, as we begin, there's sort of two correctives that I want to bring to the table. The first is this, is that when we talk about spiritual gifts, there are some of us who are like, yeah, no thanks. You hear and you're like, why did I invite my friend? I believe in God, I love spiritual gifts, but it gets weird fast. 
I love spiritual gifts. I believe in God, but I've seen this stuff misused in weird ways. I believe in spiritual gifts. I love the Lord, but I grew up in a church that scared me. <laughs> and so there's some of us that come to this conversation and we think like, I, lo- I love God. I love God. And, and I believe in the spiritual gifts for like other people. And I want to enjoy them through other people, but I'm going to lean back. I'm reticent a little bit. And one of the reasons that we do that very often, that we're wary about the gifts, it's less to do with the gifts themselves than how the gifts of the Spirit are misused in different times and places. I'm a pastor. I'm wary of this stuff. Not of the gifts of the Spirit, but of how very often the supernatural gifts of the Spirit of God can be misused. And here's one way that I wanna offer to you just by way of corrective, and that's this. It's when people and leaders begin to elevate spiritual gifts over and above spiritual fruit. So think about this with me for a while. That's right, let's. (laughs) Spiritual gifts, whoa, God is moving. Preaching, teaching, evangelizing, healing the sick, the prophetic, spiritual fruit, self-control, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness. And here's sometimes what we do is we don't measure the two things out equally. So when you see a heavy weight on the spiritual gifts and a light weight on the spiritual fruit, there is one thing I would say. I would say probably back it up a little bit. I would say that needs to bake a little bit more. There's a story in the Old Testament of an actual donkey who was given spiritual like insight, spiritual vision. That's a fantastic miracle. I would not follow the donkey. (laughs) Like as my pastor. (laughs) And too often what we see, especially in American spirituality, where we love the big and the fancy, is we elevate spiritual gifts above spiritual fruit. And what I would say to that is that will always leave you wary. Always. And so we want to make sure we get this balance right, right? Of fruitfulness, personal fruitfulness is a demonstration of the miraculous intervention of God in our lives. Are you kind? Are you self-controlled? Are you self-controlled? Shall I say it again? (laughs) So sometimes we're wary of spiritual gifts because we see them misused, but that shouldn't incline us to lean away from them. Rather, it should lead us to want to lean towards a more faithful demonstration of spiritual gifts. It should make us want to get better at being biblical. Okay? And so on the one hand, we sometimes lean away from gifts. And on the other hand, I think one of the things that we see in our culture quite a lot is that a lot of folks are like hyper prone to being super stoked about any kind of spirituality. Any kind. It's like I got my hot yoga night and I got this night and I'm just looking to live my best life ever and be fully at peace with me and the Lord and the light and peace. And, and the light inside of me honors the light inside of you. And we, we love this conversation about just general spirituality. And sometimes we forget as Christians that everything we believe is meant to be filtered through the Bible. We're meant to be distinct. So Christian spirituality does not sync up with cultural spiritualism. There's a word for this. It's syncretism. Syncretism just means we're too in sync. It's like synchronized swimming. You're not meant to be in sync with culture spirituality, but with biblical spirituality. And there we go, that's a good one. (laughs) Paul warns intensely about this. Paul is like, do not give up your Christian distinction. Don't go after everything that the whole world and culture is going after after experience-wise. You are meant to be distinctly Christian. I view Paul as a rational supernaturalist, not an irrational supernaturalist. He has a reason, a rational reason for his faith. And then he digs into the implications of that with quite a lot of rationality. 
And in one part, that's why we're doing a Holy Spirit conference in November. That's why I want you to come. It's why I want you to sign up for one of our four seminars that will be held that Saturday because I want you to be a thinking Christian who is taking your interest in spirituality and funneling it through the scriptures in a really rational way so that you don't go off way on this side or way on that side, but what we, we just walk behind the Bible when it comes to our spirituality. In verses two and three, Paul reminds his listeners that this spirituality was really interesting. He says, you know that when you were pagan, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray by mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord. Now again, Paul is saying, don't be deceived by this sort of vague spirituality in your culture. You can have a spiritual experience at your tech bro retreat. You can have a spiritual experience at a psychedelic fueled rave. That's not what Paul is talking about. What Paul is saying is that the fruit of a spiritual experience is one thing and that one thing is this, it's that Jesus is Lord. We give ourselves to him, Gordon Fees, a preeminent Bible scholar wrote it like this, the ultimate criterion of the Spirit's activity is the exaltation, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. So we move along to verse four, which if you happen to be a Bible nerd, there's maybe one in the room, a couple of you. It's one of our Trinitarian texts that we have in the New Testament, meaning that it identifies the people of or the parts of the Trinity in verse four. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God who is at work. So Paul draws us back from this sort of vague spirituality and he gives us this picture of a Trinitarian understanding of the gifts and he begins with this, that spiritual gifts are given as graces. Now Eric touched on this last week, they are given as graces. Spiritual gifts are not something that we control. I want to do that. And so I am going to exercise a spiritual gift to get that. I really want a husband. And I'm going to exercise every spiritual gift I have to get them. <laughs> They're given as graces. This is why we open up our hands in the vineyard. If you haven't been around for a while, we open up our hands not just to do it, but it's like, what do you do when someone's about to give you a really good gift? You go like, thanks, I want that thing. And scripture tells us over and over and over that the gifts of the spirit are given to us by God. They're not something that we muster up inside of ourselves. We don't need loud music or anything exciting. It's the presence of God and he comes and he gives us a good gift. And so our inner attitude is demonstrated sometimes with this outward sign of, Lord, please, thank you. They're given by God. Secondly, they're given for his service, for his service, not to amplify ourselves. In the vineyard say, you, or we would say, you get it to give it. You get it to give it. We're meant to be spilly Christians. We pour or we fill up in worship, we fill up in ministry time, we fill up with the word, and then tomorrow morning you're meant to go out wherever it is you are and spill. Spill a little bit of Christ-likeness to the world around you. We get it to give it. And then finally, Paul reminds us that the spiritual gifts that are given with power, it's God at work. And we talk in the vineyard about proclamation and demonstration, that is this, that the kingdom of God comes not just by words, but through deeds. There is an intersection of the power of God, and if you are a Christian, this is a good thing to meditate on. I believe in God who created the heavens and the earth, 
who brooded over the deep in Genesis 1 and called something out of nothing. That is God, and God revealed himself to us as a good and generous and gracious Father. There is power when God is present. Power to heal, power to change, power to restrain evil. There is power when God is present. We do not come here to feel at peace and get reminded that we are loved. Those are both very good things. But ultimately, we come over and over and over again, Lord, fill me with your power. In this world, I will have trouble. Let me shine a reflective way, your light that shines in the trouble, that shines in the darkness and is not overwhelmed by it. God, how many of you today feel overwhelmed? I am overwhelmed by the trouble. I'm overwhelmed by the trouble. There is power in the presence of God. This is why we eagerly desire the things of the gifts. And then we move on to verse seven to 11 and Paul lists out some of the giftings that we'll be talking about in subsequent weeks. I'm not going to read to you from seven to 11. I wanna back up again and look at just the, the first, uh, just the first verse um, in that section, verse seven. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. For each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good, okay? First thing I want you to notice, spiritual gifts are given by God. We just said this before, but this is an important thing for us to reflect on because then the character of the giver becomes very important, doesn't it? If you know the giver, you are either more or less excited to get the gift. Anybody know what I mean? Anybody have one of those awkward gift givers in your family? And you're excited to get the gift only because it's odd. Not because you're gonna like the gift, because you're just like, I just can't wait to see what this is gonna be. And then there's some gift givers that you are like, come on, because <laughs> you know the gift is gonna be good. We worship a God who is good. We talk a lot in the vineyard about the Father's heart. What you see when you read through scripture, this is why it's so important, church, for you to be biblical Christians, is you see a God who is in constant desire for relationship with his people. He is in constant demonstration of his goodness. He is a constant rescuer. He is a constant forgiver. He is constantly going up to the edge and over it to seek and to save that which is lost. He is a good father and he gives good gifts to his children. Do you want his good gifts? His gifts of life, of peace, of binding up the brokenhearted. He is a good giver. Second, spiritual gifts are given to each one. To each one. Now some of you maybe were raised in church environments where you're like, no, not really. Spiritual gifts is given to that person and then they got a fancy outfit to go with it and a parking space. <laughs> so one of the things that we talk a lot about in the vineyard is that everybody gets to play. And I love this because I was never picked on any teams, ever. I was like the one girl. They're like, let's, you know that game? I'm, gonna, I'm going off here, but remember the game where you just like in gym class, they'd throw balls at you? <laughs> Dodgeball, dumb game. Especially if you can't dodge. Anyways, <laughs> um, I get a gift. Like I get a gift to each one. And what that means isn't just that some of you are like, oh, I, I, don't, I don't deserve, I'm not, real, I'm, not, I'm not faithful enough. I know, but for some of you, you're like, I don't want to. I don't trust this whole thing. I, I don't want to dig in. And I, and I would just humbly say to you, we miss out on the gifts God's given you. They're given to each one and the Lord knows the world needs all of them. To each one, everybody gets to play. All of his sheep hear his voice. 
The third thing I want you to notice is that spiritual gifts are given for the common good. We are seeing more and more, I think, in American spirituality something quite different where it feels like spiritual gifts are given for me and my team so we can win. (laughs) Spiritual gifts are given so that I can get what I want. Spiritual gifts are given so that I can kind of know my future plans and not have to have a whole lot of faith. We have this misuse of spiritual gifts. Some of you maybe had church environments where you you experienced that. It's like, oh yeah, there were spiritual gifts and they were for the good of one or two people. And the rest of us, like, we got pretty hurt. What Paul says is they're given for the common good and you see this in the entire New Testament that the gifts of the Spirit, they come and they're meant to spill out not just for us, for our community and then for the world. There is meant to be a ripple effect of the goodness of God and that ripple effect is not meant to be like, wow, y'all are weird. (laughs) It's meant to be like, wow, the power of God was on display and we see this next The next thing, spiritual gifts are given to make God manifest. Now to each one, the manifestation of what? Of the Spirit. It's the manifestation of the Spirit that is given. Again, Dr. Fee writes this, these, after all, are not only gifts, they are above all manifestations of the Spirit's presence in their midst, chosen because they are, like the gift of tongues itself, extraordinary phenomena. What Paul is saying is that when the gifts of the Spirit come, they do not reveal anything particular about you, but they reveal everything about God. When people who need to be healed are healed, it tells them something about how God sees them. When people need a confirming word from the Lord, it tells them something about a good father who wants to encourage them. When people have a gift of faith stirred up after being hopeless, It tells them something about the nearness of God. They are manifestations of his presence. They make known that which is already there. To manifest does not mean to imagine something into reality. That's that's what TikTok means by manifesting. I'm going to imagine hard enough something into reality. That's not what scripture means. What scripture means is it's more like a radar. You can't see it, but it's there. The manifestations of the Spirit are when we, Christians, what is it that we do because we're part of the epic story of God? It's a quiz. We start at the beginning, we go, what story am I a part of? I'm a story, I'm a part of the story of God creating the entire universe. I'm a story, I'm a part of the story of God moving in a current through the entire world around us to his kingdom, which will come with his shalom. It began in a garden, it ends in a garden. Oh, that's my story. And then what, we step into it, and we lift our feet up, and we let the current carry us. This is why we eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. And some of us are like, I don't wanna get in the water. There's kids in that water. All of creation is groaning, not for a theoretical savior, my friends. All of creation, from your kitchen table (laughs) to our neighborhoods, to what's happening in the Middle East, to what's happening in Ukraine, to all of the other places of conflict that we aren't even articulating right now, which just demonstrates the unevenness of it all, right? All of those places, they are not growing for a theoretical savior. They are not groaning for a conceptual salvation. They are not groaning for a like, you know, the literary version of Shalom. So we can have a book club. They're groaning for real power. The real intervening of the God of the universe to restrain, to demonstrate his fruitfulness, his generosity, his joy, his peace, his faithfulness. And you and I, what Paul tells us a little bit later in 1 Corinthians 14, are meant to follow this way of love and eagerly desire the gifts so that we can be a part of the story so that we can be a part of the story. 
And we are going to do this as a church in a thoughtful and biblical and rational way. And we are going to do this in a way that values the fruit of the Spirit, most of all. But we are going to do this because our world needs the intervention of God. And I think that many of us need the intervention of God. This is why we eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. This is why we're doing a Holy Spirit conference. This is why we are doing seminars. Please. Not for my sake, not for the sake of the church, not even for your sake, for the sake of the world around us and whatever is coming your way Monday morning and Tuesday afternoon, please join us because we need to stir up our hunger for the presence and the power of God. Amen? Amen. Let me end with this. Pastor Adrian shared with me something last week a poet, uh, a, line, a line of poet Mary Oliver. Mary Oliver wrote, attention is the beginning of devotion. Attention is the beginning of devotion. In other words, we can't love what we're not paying attention to. We can't love what we don't see. Any of you, if you're like, you know, dating or married, any of you spent like a half day with your spouse and realized you haven't looked at them in the face? Am I the only one? Spend like six hours with Eric, and I'm like, did you get your hair cut? <laughs> He's like, yeah, like 8 a.m. like, oh my gosh, I have not looked at your face. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. Christians, I think a lot of us walk around in our faith just like that. Like we are not paying attention to God. We're not paying attention to things of his spirit. For whatever reason, we feel a little broke, we feel a little wary, we feel a little hopeless. I believe God is calling us to give us or to give him our attention and he'll respond to that by stirring up our devotion, all right? So would you stand with me if you're able to as we end, we're gonna um, just take time to pray with and for each other. Yeah. Just pray, come Holy Spirit. Some of you are comfortable opening your hands. Some of you are less than comfortable. Sometimes I put my hand over my heart. It's just, again, it's an outward posture of me admitting I need. That's all it is. Lord, would you increase your presence in this room? I pray especially for some of you. I just feel like there's some student age people here who just the Lord wants to really be present to. So if you're a student in particular, Lord, I just pray that you'd increase your presence over them. Would you fall? I'm just gonna be quiet here for a moment. This is what Christians do. We wait on the presence of God. So increase, God. Increase your presence on our littlest ones, our tiniest ones, Lord, all the way to some of us. You're a little on the older side. We need you, God. Increase your presence. Just come. Just come, Lord. I'm just gonna take an extra minute here. Just, just pray for an increase of the power of God in this room in the name of Jesus. And if you're online, would you maybe dial in? If you're online, you can put your hand over your heart or pray for... Uh, someone if you're with them, but God, we, want, we just need your power. Would you remind us of the current that we're in now in the name of Jesus? Let's come on. I pray, God, that you would speak to your people. I think... Um, had a couple different words that there's uh, folks here who you just feel orphaned. You feel like, I don't have a good father. And one of our pastors earlier said, if, if that's you, we would really wanna pray for you. They really felt like you actually had that thought as you were listening to me teach, I don't have a good father. And um, the truth is that God is your good and gracious father. If that's you and you're fighting with that reality, we wanna pray for you. 
I pray for those of you who feel a little winded. It's the word that I get. It's like you're just winded. You're kind of worn. Just come, Lord. I pray for, Lord, you to reissue callings on this church, Lord. We want to be people who therefore go. We want to be people who are like your body in this world. We, we don't have enough faith, we don't have enough hope, and we don't have enough love. So in the name of Jesus, we ask right now for you to deposit your faith and your hope and your love in us, and we say yes, Lord, to you. Yes, Lord, to you. Yes, Lord, we'll step in, Lord. Yes, Lord. Some of you are you're like, I don't even know what she's doing. I don't even know if I believe in this God. You are loved by God and he has a call on your life even if you don't know it. And if you're someone here and you don't even know it, you don't know what you think about any of this, but you're interested in having a conversation with one of our pastors, in just a minute, I'm gonna invite you to come up to our right. We've got some pastors and leaders. I see Pastor Jason Lohr. If you're someone in this room and you're like, I don't really know what I believe to be true about God, we would love to talk and pray with you about that. You can come up in just a moment and talk to several of our pastors over here on your right. For the rest of us now, I'm just gonna ask you to recommission yourselves to lean towards the things of the Spirit. For some of you, you wanna run up to the front, you're like, game on, why is she still talking? For some of you, you're like, ah. There are a lot of you here who you're like, I had faith for that 15 years ago. And I just, I just don't know how I feel about it right now. And I'm going to humbly and gently invite you, along with those of you who are full of fire, to come to the front. And we're just simply going to say, come Holy Spirit. We want to eagerly desire the things of you. Amen. I'm gonna invite our prayer ministry team to come forward. If you don't want someone to pray for you when you come up, you're always allowed to be like, yeah, no, thank you. No one will be offended. Especially if you're a little tender in this space, you don't have to engage with anyone. But for those of you who feel like I wanna recommission myself, I just wanna say yes again to the gifts of the Spirit, I want you to come forward. And I'm also gonna invite those of you who might be feeling a little tender, might be feeling like this is a hard conversation to have. We're just gonna pray the blessing of Christ over us in the name of Jesus. Let's worship. If you say go, If you say wait, we will wait. If you say step out on the water and they say it can't be done, we'll fix our eyes on you.
set aside to take communion at the end of our service. So if you have those elements, you can pull them out. If you're new here, you can get those by the doors. And we usually read a scripture, and today we're going to read kind of a theological passage from Paul where he talks about this good gift that Jesus' death on the cross that exchange that came through that sacrifice is that we get God's gift. So as we read this together and then we will take communion, we just create space for God to do something to be present with us even now. So you read this with me from Romans 5. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, How much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? And that is what we do. We get to reign with God. We get to partner with him to heal the world through the gift of Jesus Christ. And as we take communion, let's remember that that sacrifice that Jesus made is what brought us into that relationship. On the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, after he had given thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. And he told his disciples, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's all take the bread together. And then... In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant made in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. Amen. Amen. So before we are dismissed, there's a few things I want you guys to get on your radar and on your calendars. You've been hearing us talk about the Holy Spirit Conference that is coming up November 17th through the 19th. So this is a great opportunity to come out, to learn more about the Holy Spirit, to learn more about the gifts. Um, And you heard Pastor Julia even talking about there's going to be breakout sessions across our campuses. That's going to be able to give you actually opportunity and space to practice in the gifts that we are uh, being taught in right now and what we're learning about now and during the conference. So make sure that you go to hsc.vineyardcolumbus.org and you can get more information there or you can go out to the lobby in that little lobby bay that's right next to Irie Jam Cafe. They are, um, There's going to be a group of people that are there. They have t-shirts that are there but you can also get more information and sign up for the conference as well by doing that. Um, One of the things that we're doing to prepare for the conference outside of just coming and and learning from the certain series is that we are creating real intentional spaces to just be with the Lord, to worship the Lord. And so we're having a prayer and worship night this Thursday, the 26th. So you can come out to that. It's just going to be a really great time of just coming, being together, worshiping the Lord together, having some intentional time to just pause and hear from the Lord. And also on the 29th, next Sunday at 1230, we are going to have our prayer ministry training. So every week, if you're here, you know that we always have a call for you to come down and get prayer. And we need people to come down and pray for our brothers and sisters the same way that somebody has probably been been there to pray for you when you've needed it. So if you're someone who's been interested in doing it, or if you're someone who's like, I really don't want to do that, but I keep feeling like God keeps pulling me up there every week, like I'm supposed to go up there and pray. I'm just a little nervous. I don't know what to do. You can come to this training, and you, we're going to walk you through about how to pray for somebody with the Holy Spirit. Amen? And that's, so yeah, the, the 29th. All right, let me pray for us. Lord, I, I just ask just for more of what... Julia asked for that you would just fill us, not just in the space, but as we leave these doors, that our neighborhoods, our families, our workspaces would feel your presence by us being there.
because of how much you have filled us today, Lord. We love you. We thank you. And we ask for your kingdom to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all have a blessed weekend.